الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم As my brother introduced the topic this evening Muslims in a non-Muslim society we can find particular relevance to this topic in the very verses which our brother recited in the beginning of our presentation. These verses from Surah and Nisa address the status of Muslims in a non-Muslim environment. Before looking at these verses, it is important for us to understand that the foundation for our understanding of social, personal, economic, etc. issues can only be found in the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Allah has told us in no uncertain terms, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنًا there is in the Messenger of Allah for you the best of examples. His seerah, his biography, is there not merely for us to read about it in books, to memorize the details and the facts of it. Uh, we share it on special occasions. Uh, we read it for particular purposes other than that implementation in our lives. Prophet Muhammad's life, his biography, represents for us the blueprint for our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have sent messages to humankind in books, scriptures, by themselves. He already had given us enough to find the right way, telling us with regards to the human soul, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Each and every soul has already been given a knowledge of righteousness and evil and corruption. There was enough there to guide us. However, Allah in His mercy also revealed scriptures to confirm what is right and what is known to be right. Inviting people to that righteousness, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to as al-ma'roof, that which is known to be good, known by every human society. Training them and teaching them to avoid what is evil, what is known to be evil, what is rejected by all societies, referred to as al-munkar, Describing the true believers as those who يَعْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفُ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ Those who command that known good and invite others to avoid the known evil and they believe in Allah. Allah did not leave us human beings merely with that internal knowledge which we refer to as the fitra which every child is born with part of that fitra that knowledge of right and wrong and Allah knowledge of Allah is the greatest knowledge of what is a right Allah did not leave Allah did not leave human beings with that internal knowledge and the scripture he sent messengers to demonstrate to human beings how to implement that message. They were the guides, they were the examples of how to implement the message. So that human beings would not say, in looking at the instructions of the scriptures, the Quran, the Torah, the Injil, etc., they would not say, this is for angels. This is not for human beings. 
How can we do these things? Human beings were sent as messengers amongst them to demonstrate to them how these instructions, these divine instructions could be implemented. And that is Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, the last of those messengers. His seerah contains, as I said, the blueprint for Muslims in a non-Muslim society, as well as Muslims in a Muslim society. These are the two possible existences. A Muslim might either exist in a non-Muslim society, or he or she may exist in a Muslim society. And Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's life demonstrates to us how do we function in both circumstances. The non-Muslim phase is referred to as the Meccan period, the period before the Hijrah. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, received the revelation in Mecca and he invited the people of Mecca to Islam. A few accepted during that period. And they suffered under a pagan system, a system which invited to idolatry and looked at the worship of one God as being dangerous to its own existence and as such punished those who sought to promote this message. What we find is that during this period Muslims went through two basic changes. One, the message was kept in secret and spread only on a personal level to those close. And after certain Muslims accepted Islam who were known for their courage and their strength, then the message was promoted openly. This is amongst the masses of the Muslims. And as a result of the oppression which they underwent in that Meccan period, a group amongst them made hijra. They emigrated to Ethiopia. In that emigration, we have the direct implementation of this particular verse in Surah An-Nisa which we have to look at when we as Muslims here in India address the issues of how to survive in a non-Islamic society how to survive and it's an issue that Muslims have to consider. Without considering it, they are doomed to destruction. We are already living a lost generation. Muslims, Muslim youths, etc. Growing up in this society, we have a lost generation. They are neither non-Muslims nor are they Muslims. They're somewhere in between, not knowing which way really to turn. We can only survive in this society if we address the fundamental issues which are necessary for our survival in accordance with the Sirah, in accordance with the example of Prophet Muhammad particularly that example in the Meccan period because it is most similar to the situation of Muslims here in India as well as Muslims in other locations whether it be in Sri Lanka or in the Philippines or in the West 
in America, in Canada, in England. This is, these, are, these are issues which I have addressed on a number of occasions in lectures given in America, in Canada, and in England. And they are as much relevant as they are here in India. Though India represents the largest Muslim minority in the world, a minority so large that it is larger than all of the Arab Muslim countries. There is no Arab Muslim country with a larger population than the Muslim minority in India. Sounds very strange. When Islam in fact began amongst the Arabs in the terms of the last message of Islam and its propagation to mankind, that's where it began. So when we're looking at this period, and we look at this verse in Surah An-Nisa in which Allah says إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ ظَالِمِي أَنفُسِهِمْ قَالُوا فِي كُنْتُمْ Indeed, those whom the angels take their souls in a state of self-oppression they are asked by the angels, what was your situation? Allah refers to people in sin, in disobedience to Allah, as being dhalimu and fusihim, self-oppressors, oppressing themselves. Why? Because when we disobey Allah, We do not hurt Allah in any way. We hurt ourselves. If every human being on the face of the earth decided to worship Allah and to obey Him, it would not increase Allah in any way. Just as if all human beings, the, the jinn, the angels, the rest of creation decided to disobey Allah. Those amongst the creation who could, it would not decrease Allah in any way. So Allah refers to sin. Those who are in a state of sin, in a state of disobedience to Allah's command as being in a state of self-oppression. Because whatever they have done will only come back to harm them in the next life. If not in this life, and as Allah tells us, whatever calamities befall us, it is from our own hands, what of our own deeds, the result of our own deeds. If not in this life, for sure in the next life we will find the consequence of our deeds. So whatever wrong we do, we harm ourselves. So Allah describes those whom the angels take their souls in a state of sin, in a state of disobedience to Allah. The angels ask them, Fima kuntum, what was your condition? Their response we were weak and oppressed in the land. We were weak. We were that minority. There was this pagan society around us oppressing us. This is why we were disobedient to you, O oh Allah. This is why we disobeyed Allah. We did not fulfill His commands because we were in this state of oppression from the society around us. This is the state of Muslims in a non-Muslim society. A state of self-oppression. So what did the angels say back to them? The angels said, قَالُوا أَلَمْ تَكُنْ أَرْضُ اللَّهِ وَاسِعَةً فَتُهَاجِرُوا فِيهَا Wasn't Allah's earth expansive that you could make hijrah 
you could leave, go elsewhere in it. And then the angels completed saying, فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَسِيرًا for those, their home will be the hellfire, Jahannam, Wasa'at Masira, the worst of ends. This verse, I think everyone who lives in a non Muslim society needs to read regularly. Surah An Nisa. The fourth chapter, verse 97. It needs to be read regularly. As a wake up. As a reminder to ourselves. What is our situation? What is the excuse for us being in this situation? Do we have an excuse acceptable to Allah? Can we say, Kunna mustada'afina fil ard? Will Allah accept that? To be fair, Allah does go on to say, He will accept it from some. Allah says, إِلَّا الْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوِلْدَانِ لَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ حِيلَةً وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ سَبِيلًا Except for those who were truly oppressed among the men and the women and the children who had no other way out. They had no way out. And there was no path made clear for them. Those Allah will, out of His mercy, have forgiveness for, because Allah is oft forgiving most merciful this is Allah he will forgive those who are in that state not out of choice so what is in front of us we have in front of us Muslims in a non-Muslim society the example of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, of Hijrah And this is why Muslim scholars from the earliest of times ruled in their fatwas that it was not permissible for Muslims to live in the midst of non-Muslims. This is something that we have to realize and to know. This is something agreed upon by the scholars of the past. It is not permissible based on Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu statement that he absolves himself and a bari'un from whoever dies in the midst of the disbelievers. Meaning they chose that. Because in his time, when Hijra was made, we had the Hijra to Ethiopia, then the Hijra to Medina. When the Hijra to Medina was made, it was compulsory for Muslims who had any means to make that hijrah to make the hijrah. It was compulsory. And the hijrah is something which did not end in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu As is narrated by Muawiyah, that he heard Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu say, لا تنقطع الهجرة حتى تنقطع التوبة. The hijra will not end as an obligation, as a responsibility, until tawbah, repentance, is no longer accepted. وَلَا تَنْقَطِعُ tawbah حَتَّى تَطْلُعَ الشَّمْسِ مِنْ مَغْرِبِهَا And tawbah will not end until the sun rises in the west, from the place of its setting. Hijrah remains for Muslims until the last days of this earth. 
So it is something that we have to look at historically. We know this continent went through a period of change where it divided and formed the different nations, India, Pakistan, then Pakistan, Bangladesh, so on and so forth. There were issues involved, some of them nationalistic, some of them Islamic, some of them capitalistic. As Muslims, it is necessary to readdress and to relook at that process of what took place. And to form a proper opinion, a guided opinion as to the past, so that we will better know how to deal with the future. But if we look at the options from the Meccan model of either staying and struggling here or leaving, moving elsewhere, whether it is out of the country or it is within the country, because Hijra doesn't necessarily mean everybody has to pack up their bags and leave India. It could mean moving to some other location in India. Meaning if you are oppressed in one location, go to another location where there are more Muslims, you have more of a community, you can feel safer in the practice of your Islam. That is real. Of course, such a move means sacrifice because maybe your business is here, all your uh, relatives and all your connections and everything, your roots are here. So for you to pick up and go elsewhere in India, you feel this is going to be personal loss to yourself. Economic loss. And so you don't move. But you think Allah will accept that reason on the Day of Judgment because you feared economic loss? Allah goes on to say in the hundredth verse, the verse which wasn't read in the beginning, after talking about this hijra, He then praised those who made that sacrifice for the hijra, saying, وَمَنْ يُحَاجِرْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ يَجِدْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُرَاغَمًا كَثِيرًا وَسَعَى That whoever makes hijra for the sake of Allah will find in this earth many places of uh, refuge and economic, social, etc. Uh, opportunities. This is Allah's promise. وَمَنْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْتِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ That whoever leaves his or her home, making hijra for the sake of Allah and His Messenger, ثُمَّ يُدْرِكْهُ الْمَوْتِ And death catches him. فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ His or her reward is guaranteed from Allah. Reward of what? Reward of paradise. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. So we shouldn't fear. If we truly find difficulty, find we're not able to practice Islam properly, find our children are losing it, or going astray, for economic reasons and social reasons, we should not hesitate to make that hijra for the sake of Allah. Because Allah has promised us success. And if we believe in Allah, then how can we doubt what He has promised? Now for those who were not able to make the hijra in the Meccan period, what did they do? They developed with the guidance of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, a strategy for survival. 
He taught them. They clustered together as best as they could, educating each other, living, helping each other economically. Those who were in a state of servitude were being tortured. Their freedom was bought. And you know, there, were this, there was this cooperation, community cooperation there. which linked them all together, even though they were physically in different circumstances within the Meccan society. So in a similar manner, Muslims who see before them no opportunity for making hijrah, we are here. The mass of Muslims are not able to go anywhere. What do we do? We have to develop strategies for survival how to survive what should be our goal here we should have a clear goal if we don't have a clear goal then we are in a state of loss it is very easy for us to go astray our priorities will be backwards and for sure, we will destroy our own lives. So it is essential for us to identify what should be our goals here in this circumstance, in this non-Muslim society. And the primary goal should be the establishment of Islam to whatever degree is possible on an individual as well as on a communal level. It is essential for us to see that as our goal. This is what commanding the good is and prohibiting the evil. It is the establishment of Islam because Islam is about good and prohibiting evil. The commandments of Allah, whatever Allah has commanded us to do, is the good, is the ultimate good. And whatever He has prohibited us from, is evil, is the ultimate of evils. So it is our responsibility to establish Islam in the localities that we are if we're not able to make any form of hijrah. And even if we make the hijrah, the hijrah is to establish it elsewhere, in another community, to be a part of an effort to establish Islam in that other community. Because Islam is community. It is something which may be implemented on an individual level if there's no community. Because what we cannot do, which requires community activity, where there is no community, Allah is most merciful. But when we look at all of the basic practices of Islam, from the shahada, the declaration of faith, the declaration of faith is not something you do inside your heart and carry on. It is something which must be done to the community. The establishment of salah, the prayer, the establishment of prayer is in the masjids, in jama'ah, in community. Fasting requires somebody to see the moon, to inform the community. Breaking the fast, we have zakat al-fitr, feeding the community. Zakah, taking from our wealth to give to whom? The community. Hajj, the world community of Muslims. Worshipping Allah together. Islam is about community. So, we have to define or identify the proper methodology given our circumstances here for achieving those goals, the goals of establishing Islam on a, an individual level as well as on a community level. The first step is what? It is education. This is the first step, is education. 
This is where the establishment of Islam begins in education. Why Prophet Muhammad said, Talabul ilmi farid ala kulli Muslim. Seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. Whomsoever Allah wishes good for, He gives him or her a good understanding, a deep understanding of the religion. The best of you is he or she who learns the Quran and teaches it to others. Education. Education. Prophet Muhammad also said that this world, dunya mal'una, this world is cursed. Mal'unun ma fiha, all in it is cursed. Illa dhikrullah, wa ma wala, except for the remembrance of Allah. And what helps us to remember Allah? وَعَالِمًا وَمُتَعَلِّمًا And the teacher and the student. Education. Prophet Muhammad elevated education to the level of ibadah. Saying that whoever takes a path seeking knowledge man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman sahala allahu lahu tariqan ila aljanna allah will make easy for him or her the path to paradise it is ibadah education knowledge the seeking of knowledge, the gaining of knowledge, the passing on of knowledge is ibadah, is worship of Allah. It is among the things which will help us to go to paradise. So it is priority. It should be a priority. Allah tells us in the Quran, يَعْلَمُوا أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا Allah. No! Illa who? That there is no God worthy of worship but Him. Know it. Knowledge must precede faith. For faith to be rightly placed knowledge must precede it because if it is about faith only then everybody in this world who has faith and you have people who have faith in Marx and Lenin very committed firm faith that their way was the best way and is the best way for humanity very strong faith while Disbelieving in Allah, in God, having firm faith that there is no God. So if it is about faith, then all is lost. It is about knowledge first, and then faith. The prophets, alayhim salam brought knowledge, and with it, in its implementation, there arose faith. By the grace of Allah, the faith which is acceptable to Allah is the one based on divine knowledge. So our priority in terms of knowledge is the deen. I know people will say talabul ilm farid ala kulli muslim and that means okay we should become doctors and lawyers and everything else. This is where we should be. It's knowledge. Yes, it is knowledge. But the beginning is knowledge of the deen. This is priority. Because even in the seeking of knowledge, in the gaining of knowledge, we have to put it on different levels of priority. There is knowledge 
which is essential for us in both this life and the next. And there is knowledge which is useful or essential for us in this life and not in the next. Which one are you going to put priority on? The one which is essential for both this life and the next. That is knowledge of the deed. Knowledge of our worldly affairs is essential or useful in this life. But it is of no relevance in the next. So though it is important, and though it is a part of the knowledge which we need to gain, the primary knowledge has to be knowledge of the deen. Knowledge of Islam. And when we approach this knowledge, we have to realistically look at our circumstances. Where do we gain our knowledge from? Some people say we gain it from our foreparents. My parents were Muslims, and I grew up in their family. I do what they did. But we have to question ourselves. Were our parents Sahaba? Meaning they got whatever they did from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we have to question ourselves. No, they weren't. So what does that mean? It means then that we cannot simply say, "I'm going to follow whatever my parents did." That this is my source of gaining knowledge of Islam. Because if my parents didn't get their knowledge from Rasulullah then there is a possibility that their knowledge is incorrect. This is something we have to realistically look at. And there was a particular incident which took place in the time of Prophet Muhammad narrated by Abu Waqid al Laiti, which is found in a Tirmidhi and Al-Nasai, authentic, in which he reported that Prophet Muhammad when he and the companion set out for Hunayn, they were going to that last battle in the 10th year of the Hijra after the conquest of Mecca. They are going to the last major battle with the pagans. On their way, they came across a tree. This tree was referred to in Arabic as that and what. You could call it the hanging tree, the tree on which things were hung. That to Anwar. The pagans used to hang their weapons on it before they went to battles, etc. They used to go and hang their weapons on it, their shields, their swords, whatever, believing that in hanging it on this tree, this tree had special powers that would infuse inside of their weapons and made their swords sharper and their shields better, more able to protect them against the arrows or the swords, etc. This was their belief. Now amongst the Sahaba were some who had recently converted to Islam. And after the conquest of Mecca, they converted to Islam. They went on out with Prophet Muhammad immediately. So they asked the Prophet when they saw the tree, and they knew that this was a tree for pagans. And as Muslims, obviously, this was the tree for pagans. You can't, as a Muslim, deal with it. So what they did was they asked Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, can you set aside a tree for us? They wanted an Islamic tree to hang their weapons on. These are people who had just converted to Islam. They understood the general issues of paganism. But this concept was lost on them. They didn't quite, they didn't understand it. This will happen. Prophet Musa, after they crossed the Red Sea, make an idol for us as the pagans have their idol. That you will follow the way of the people before you. So, Understanding that this happened 
in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was there, he corrected it and gave them the proper direction, proper understanding. And they conveyed that to the generations that came after. But in the intervening generations, as Islam spread out of Arabia throughout the rest of the world, and people came into Islam in different places, like India, do you think that what happened to those Sahaba in that first generation, those who had newly accepted Islam in Mecca, do you think what happened to them didn't happen to Muslims here in India? These are the questions that we need to ask ourselves when we look at the source from which we are going to take our knowledge of Islam. We're going to learn Islam, we're going to build Islam in ourselves. We recognize that as a necessity. But where do we take it from? Where is the pure source? The spring of life, where is it? It is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. This is where it is. It is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. This is revelation from Allah. This is where salvation, where life lies. And we have to be very careful that we don't fall into the same situation which the pagans exhibited in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as referred to uh, in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 104 wherein Allah describes the response of the pagans to the call to the Quran and the Sunnah we said this is the source of life and the pagans who went astray, who died in a state of disbelief and went to hell, their response we should be well aware of. What was their response? Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَى مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَلَى الرَّسُولُ And if you say to them, Muhammad وسلم, come to what Allah has revealed and to his messenger, to the Quran and to the Sunnah. Qalu, their response, Hasbuna ma wajadna alayhi abana. It is enough for us what we found our four parents doing. It is enough for us what we found our four parents doing. This was the response of the pagans. This was the response of disbelief. This was the response which caused Abu Talib to go to hell. Abu Talib, who raised Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who knew who he was, who knew he was a prophet of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, but on his deathbed, when Prophet Muhammad وسلم, invited him and said, Say La ilaha illallah. Uncle, say La ilaha illallah. And I will be a witness with you before Allah on the day of judgment. And Abu Talib's brothers were there saying to him, Are you going to embarrass our family? Are you going to degrade our family? Are you going to reject the ways of our foreparents? Were our foreparents all wrong? Was Abdul Muttalib wrong? Was Abdul Manaf wrong? Were they all wrong? Are you going to reject that? And Abu Talib chose to go with the way of his foreparents. And what was the result? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that he receives the least punishment on the day of judgment. The least. For the good that he did in terms of raising the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, protecting him, etc., etc. He received the least. For what is the least described in Sahih Muslim? That the hellfire will reach up to his ankles. 
Only his ankles will be in the hellfire. But it will be enough for his brains to boil. And he will think that he is receiving the worst punishment of anybody in hell. That is the re result. That is the consequence of that response. Hasbuna ma wajadna alayhi abaana. It is enough for us what our foreparents did, what they're doing. That's enough. This is the response of misguidance. The response of the pagans. So we have to be very careful about this. When we are invited, when somebody invites us to what Allah and His Messenger said, that we do not respond to them by saying what? Well, this is not what my parents did. My parents were doing something else and I'm going to do what they did. I am from this community or that community. Our community does this and that and the other. The explanation is not, well, Allah also said that. Or Prophet Muhammad also said that. So we can properly choose. Because of course, not everybody who comes to you and says, Allah said this and the Prophet said that, is necessarily having the right understanding. And so you just automatically should stop whatever you're doing and follow it. Because the knowledge of the Qur'an is vast and the Sunnah is also vast. Therefore, we also have to have a knowledge and a comparative knowledge of, of the Sunnah as well as the Qur'an. So, that response, which is based on comparative knowledge, this is an acceptable response. This is, we're trying to judge what is right according to knowledge. We're not doing it according to emotion because this is what was the response of the pagans. That is based on emotion. My parents did it. My grandparents did it. My great grandparents were doing it. So were they all wrong? Am I going to say they're all wrong? See, this is emotion. This is not looking at the thing, is it right or is it wrong, really? Factually speaking. You know, we have, what is our criterion for determining right and wrong? It can't be emotion, because emotion blinds, blinds. We have to do it on the basis of knowledge, correct knowledge. So, we have to develop the correct knowledge of Allah, the correct knowledge of the Sunnah, and in the process, we have to eliminate from ourselves the vestiges of that to unwat. Meaning, we have to look into ourselves and into our practices and remove those practices which are from pre-Islamic times, which we have inherited, which we have adopted from the cultures around us, etc. Some of these practices may seem very simple. Some of them may seem very big. But we have to know that no matter how small things are, for us to make a big change, we have to be able to make small changes. Because if we find difficulty in making small changes, you can be sure we're not going to be able to make the big change. So, when knowledge comes to us on a personal level, that knowledge may, re may be about simple, small things in terms of men. That knowledge may be, brother, grow your beard. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said in Sahih Bukhari, grow your beards and trim your mustache. So some brothers say, this is not important. It's not an important part of the religion. Islam is in the heart. You must be sincere, everything else. This is what needs to be. You know, these outward things are not important. But one has to question oneself. Is Islam only inward? Or is it both inward and outward? Why are we so 
reluctant? Why are we so unwilling to do something so basic when there's clear instruction for us? Or another person may say, brother, your pants are below your ankles. Raise your pant above your ankle. Brother, what is this? Is this all the religion is? It's just about your short pants or long pants? Come on, man. It's more important things. You know? There's an atomic bomb being developed here in India and one in, in Pakistan. And what's going to happen? And you're going to tell me about shortening my pants? We have to question here. You see, this is a small thing. It may seem to be insignificant. But Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he said in authentic hadith that what is below the ankle is in the hellfire. He said that. He made a big thing of it. So it is not the person who comes and passes this information to us. We should not respond to, oh, why are you making such a big thing about such a small thing? No. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a big thing about it. And we have to question ourselves. Why is it such a problem for us to shorten our pants? Brother says, well, you know, the hadith, when it spoke about Abu Bakr, it said, uh, one who drags his garment or lets it below the ankle out of pride. So I'm not doing it out of pride. It's not pride. We say, brother, why... Don't you shorten the path. Look into yourself. Is it because you feel that in doing that, you will be out of style? You're not in fashion? Hmm? Is that the reason? Because back in the 60s, everybody wore their pants above the ankle. Okay? That was the style then. It's meaning that if you were back in the 60s, you would have no problem wearing it above your ankles. But now because we are in the 80s, oh no, it's not, uh, it's out of style. So what is happening, of course, when you deliberately buy your pants, because you're buying it and it can be tailored, set, whatever, you're deliberately buying a pants which will now go below your ankle, and you look at yourself in the mirror, you check your pants and so on, so you see, looks good. You feel good. You feel proud to be in fashion. And if you weren't in fashion, you would feel uncomfortable. Think about it. This out of fashion fashion is the fashion of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And he said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever loves a way, a fashion other than mine, is not a true follower of mine. Aren't we here loving the ways of the disbelievers? Isn't it their fashion? Isn't it they who put their pants below their ankles? And they did it at a particular period of time, which has to do with historical developments in America when the hippies came out, and the hippies were about letting all hang out, their hair long, everything long, dragging on the ground, everything. And then in the West, you see the West has a way of turning every trend into profitable business. So long hair became a fashion. Long pants dragging below the ankles became a fashion. So it was just integrated into the economics of the system. That's the reason. So we have to look at the situation today. These are small things, as I said. They're small things. But if we have difficulty dealing with such small things as this, growing your beard is to stop shaving. It's not doing something you weren't doing, but it's not doing something you were doing. It's always easier to stop doing than to do. You, have, you can't do that. Shortening your, you know, the variety of other things. Similarly, in the case of women, you know, with the hijab, we know what Prophet Muhammad said about what is hijab. We know what Allah said about hijab. 
We all know it is not something new. But yet, our women insist on going around wearing hijab, which is so thin you can see what is underneath. So what hijab is this? Prophet ﷺ said one of the signs of the last day is that the women will be dressed but undressed. They're wearing clothing, but they may as well not be wearing clothing because you can see what is underneath. Or they're wearing garments. You know, the, instead of wearing the outer garments which should cover them in loose fashion, etc. They're wearing styles which are tight-fitting. You can see the shapes of their bodies and all this kind of thing. And if they are questioned, so this is our culture. You know, we are, this is Indian style, you know. We're not uh, Egyptians, we're not Saudis, we're not, you know. That's their cultural thing. Of course, imitating their fashion or their way is not required in Islam. What we are required to imitate is the way prescribed by Allah and His Messenger. So, it is essential for us to look back into ourselves and to make these kind of corrections. It's essential for us to look into our families and the role of the families with regards to education, the responsibilities. We have a responsibility to teach our children, to create an environment in the home which is an Islamic environment, which will encourage them to remember Allah. If our environment in the home is television, watching Hindi movies and, you know, singing, dancing, all this wild stuff. And then we wonder when our children want to get out and do these same things. We say, why, why? You know, this is not Muslim. This is what we have raised them on. We have a responsibility in the home, that area that we control, to establish an Islamic environment. An environment wherein the remembrance of Allah is there. Not to say that it is without fun, without laughter, without, you know, the enjoyment of life, yes. But it should be in accordance with the way and the guidance that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave us. Similarly, in the community, there is a responsibility for education. And when we look at the family and the community, we have to look at issues. There are certain pressing issues in the society today which have to do with the practices of the people of the past. And I just mention them because I know it is a disease here. The disease regarding dowry, for example. These are family problems now, community problems. The dowry issue. That when a man wants to marry his daughter he has to give money, wealth, to the bride, groom, bridegroom, the male. Islam has mahar. The mahar is given by the male to the female to indicate a symbolic of his preparedness to look after that young lady, that lady woman. This is mahar. That's what we have in Islam. But in Hindu culture and in Christian culture, the practice is the opposite. They paid the men to marry their daughters. This is their practice. As a result, you have the phenomenon in India of bride burnings. I'm not telling you something that you're not well aware of how many hundreds of women are burnt to death every year by their husbands and their mothers-in-laws and others because they didn't bring the dowries that were promised or the family wants more. Now, one may say, oh, that's their problem. But guess what? I read in the newspaper uh, not too long ago that in Dhaka, well, you might say it's not India, but it's India. I mean, people draw the lines and say, this is Bangladesh and this is India, but reality, it is all one. In Dhaka, it said, a greedy husband burned to death his young wife at Sikpara in the city following a feud over dowry. 
police said. They said Zahir Mia poured gasoline over the body of his wife Shahnaz and set her on fire on Sunday. She died at Dhaka Medical College Hospital yesterday. This is Muslims. This is a sickness. It is something which the Muslim community must eradicate. It is something which is harmful to the community. This is why you will find that men, when their wives give birth to daughters, their face is, oh, another girl, a girl. If their wife can't give birth to boys, they want to divorce them. This happens amongst Muslims. The boy, they're happy. The girls are not happy. Why? Because girls are problems. You have to think about how much money you have to know. You know, you have five, six daughters, you are, your life is now hell. You have to be raised and getting money from here, there, everything, trying to get them married. So much so that this belief has led to a distortions of basic Islamic practices. So you will find it common amongst Muslims who have this belief of this dowry, etc. They will say, it is not compulsory for a man to make hajj if he has a daughter of marriageable age. Priority is getting his daughter married. So it is not required of him to make hajj until he gets his daughter married. This is falsehood. This is a lie. This is against Islam. Prophet Muhammad said, whoever has the means to make hajj and doesn't make hajj, it makes no difference to Allah whether he died a Christian or a Zoroastrian or whatever. Hajj is compulsory once one has the means. This new idea has only come up because Muslims have started the practice of paying dowries for their daughters. That's where it came from. So you can see how false ideas like this can actually go back and hurt the very pillars of Islam, damage them, distort them. So people will, will not fulfill a pillar of Islam because of this innovation. This topic is a very vast topic. So I just would like to in the few remaining minutes touch on some other aspects related to the establishment of Islam in a non-Muslim society and that is in regards to organizations organization the setting up of institutions and as we spoke of education and we spoke of education of the religion as a priority we said that there is also a second level priority of education necessary for survival in this society, means, meaning the academic knowledge which is necessary for the community to survive. That academic knowledge is to be gotten in academic institutions. So it is essential for Muslims to establish academic institutions which have the proper ethos, the proper concept, the proper goals, the pro proper uh, methodologies. If we put our children in non-Muslim schools taught by non-Muslims, can we expect them to grow up with an Islamic understanding? And they spend more time in the schools than they spend at home. What is going to be the end result? The end result is what we are seeing around us today. Where the masjids are filled with the old and the dying. The youths are elsewhere. In the cinema, in the discos, etc. This is the reality of a lack of an educational system by which to convey Islam 
in an academic environment so that the graduates of such schools would be able to take their place in society with the correct perspective. It means that we need institutions. We need schools, primary, secondary schools, which are teaching in English medium. In English medium because the future, the present, is in English medium and knowledge. Teaching academics your science is all the subjects, but by Muslim teachers and from an Islamic perspective. The Islamization of knowledge. This is a process which is arising in different parts of the Muslim world today. But to a large degree it is absent here. In Mumbai, how many such institutions exist for Muslims? How many? I think none. Virtually none. And the sin of not having it is borne by the community. We cannot say, well, we are in a non-Muslim country. No. We have the means. We have millionaire Muslims, right, in our midst, economically capable to set up such institutions. Institutions which, are, which achieve the excellence in academia, but at the same time graduate students who have a sense of responsibility to their community. That they come out as a doctor, but they're not thinking I'm being a doctor because it makes a lot of money, I can get a nice house and car and have a nice life, but no. I have this knowledge to use to serve my community. I will give of this, of my time, freely. Some of my time will be set aside in community service. This is missing. Missing across the board because we have no Islamic institutions which inculcate that in the minds, in the souls of the children. And economic institutions. Muslims are involved in riba up to their eyeballs. And it has been justified. But Allah said that He and His Messenger have declared war on those who refuse to give up riba. We have the means to set up alternatives. Islamic banking is something rising in other parts of the Muslim world. It needs to be established here. And those who have the knowledge and have the means, who do not do so, they carry the sin for the community. Because they could save the community from this evil, and they deliberately choose not to. It involves sacrifice, for sure. But Islam involves sacrifice. Remember, brothers and sisters, paradise is not cheap. There was a time in Europe during the Crusades when the Pope offered what were called indulgences. Indulgences were certificates which said the bearer of this certificate is to be given a place. This is a directive to God. The bearer of this certificate is to be given a place in paradise. They sold this to the population. They were called papal indulgences. They were sold to the population. People paid money, you know, and bought these certificates signed by the Pope, guaranteeing them places in paradise. Okay, this is history. Muslims today feel that they are guaranteed paradise. And the reality, as Prophet Muhammad said, and I'll close with this hadith, Kullu ummati yadkhuluna al-jannah. 
all of my ummah will enter paradise. The mass of Muslims heard this and said, MashaAllah, no need to do anything after that. The Prophet has said, all of his ummah is going to paradise, finish. That's it. Muslims are in paradise, non-Muslims are in hell. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't stop there. He went on to say, Illa man abba, except he who refuses. The companions asked the Prophet ﷺ, Waman ya'ba ya Rasulullah? Who would refuse, O Messenger of Allah? He said, Man ata'ani dakhana jannah. Whoever obeys me will enter paradise. Waman asani faqad abba. And whoever disobeys me has refused. Whoever disobeys me has refused to go to paradise. So let us get back to the realities of the religion. Built on the foundations of the Quran and the Sunnah. Let us transform that knowledge into faith by living in accordance with the Qur'an and the Sunnah, not merely speaking about it, being aware of it, but living in accordance with it, because it is in the living that faith is born. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.